Welcome to a Peel Yourself Off the Mat Monday edition of Barrier Bookie. I'm Jeff DeForest. Very happy to have you guys with us after an incredible weekend of action where, uh, once again, we were on the winning side of things to the tune of uh, somewhere between six and a hook and seven and three with our various handicappers that we featured during the week, Troy West, Scotty M, and the professor. And uh, this week, we hope to do the same. That's three straight winning weeks for us, so uh, we're happy about that. Uh, we did learn something and uh, once again reinforced uh, my opinion that you always have to give credence, people, to teams uh, that are ominously operating under the dark cloud of a curse. Now, we've seen a couple of those exercised uh, over the years. Uh, of course, the curse of the Bambino, the most famous uh, of sporting curses, uh, that was uh, finally exercised, uh, what, 2004, went with that big comeback in the Boston Red Sox, breaking through, winning the uh, World Series. Uh, Curse of the Billy Goat with the Chicago Cubs uh, lasted 100 years. I certainly uh, was a source of, of much uh, despair for Cub fans over the years. They got used to it, and uh, eventually uh, they were all hoping uh, maybe uh, guys that were fans for 90 years, hey, please, just one championship before I die. And some of those people were rewarded as the Cubs finally snapped that thing. But uh, there are a couple of teams uh, that are in play and have been in play uh, both uh, over the weekend and coming up again tonight that I believe are operating on some kind of curse, some matter of the occult. One would be the New York Jets, and we saw evidence of that on Sunday, and that would be the curse of Joe Willie. I'm the biggest Joe Willie fan in the world. I worked at Chase Stadium selling souvenirs when Joe Willie was chucking a rock. I didn't care if he threw six picks against the Denver Broncos and the swirling winds at Shea. We loved the guy. He was a character. That time he came in with uh, two babes that were basically holding him up to the AFC Championship game in 1968, I happened to be right by the gate where the players uh, made their entrance into the stadium. Everybody's looking around. It's about 12 o'clock for a 1 o'clock kickoff. Everything is on the line in this game. The uh, dreaded Raiders are in town, and people are crying, hey, where, where, where's Joe Willie? Where's Joe Willie? Anybody seen him? Did he show up? I see him come staggering in. Uh, he had uh, two Swedish models that were literally holding him up. And, of course, uh, this is the stuff of which legends are made. We came to later find out he was out prowling around till 4 or 5 in the morning, uh, significantly liquored up, and uh, uh, was barely able to stand by the time he came into the studio, I mean, the stadium, bad, bad knees and all. And uh, then threw that pass to Don Maynard, and the uh, rest is history. But, but the curse began after Joe Willie held out one finger in the air. It was this hand, actually, right? After winning Super Bowl three, and you could say, people, that that was the last big game that the New York Jets have had. And the Jet fans are crying today, crying. And they don't realize that they're probably operating under a curse. We'll get to the details on that and the week that we had and what's on tap because uh, there's no shortage of action today, including a deciding game in the wild card chase in the National League, a doubleheader on tap between the Mets and the Braves. Either team wins one game, they're both in. Uh, Braves sweep. And uh, the uh, either team sweeps, and one of those, uh, the team that loses the doubleheader is out. And the Arizona, the Snakes, literally slither their way into the postseason after the phenomenal run they had to the World Series at 150 to 1 last year. Now, if you're betting on the games, uh, if you were wagering over the weekend, you got paid. If you followed our picks, as I said, uh, we're going to give ourselves credit for six and a half and three. Because there was a little dispute about one of the lines that we gave out uh, in uh, Troy West's handicapping of the Thursday night game. Bet Online would be the place to go, though. Uh, Bet Online, the most trusted betting platform, your number one source for everything football. Bet Online has every stat, every matchup, even live odds and spreads to bet on during the games while the games are being played. If you think you know your stuff, get in on the $200,000 mega contest. Pick five games against the spread every week for your chance at weekly prizes and a share of $200,000. When the game's over, you can head on over to the online casino. Bet online is great. They have poker, they have blackjack, over 150 slot games that you can indulge in and uh, start spinning those wheels and see if you can make some cash. Head to the website today to get in on all the action. Bet online. The game starts here. All right, we mentioned this thing about the uh, curse. Uh, I, I believe this. Uh, the Jets are operating under a curse, and, and you can see evidence of that. I mean, look what's happened here. They, they doled out all of his cash for uh, Aaron Rodgers. He gets hurt. Uh, we all know the story now. Gets hurt on the third snap of the previous season, out for the year. Starts doing a whole bunch of strange things. Uh, you could almost think that you could add him to the ticket there uh, with uh, Trump and J.D. Vance for saying strange things and relating weird experiences in a fashion that makes you wonder, uh, is this guy okay? 
All right, so it comes out this year, and the Jets overwhelmingly optimistic after their win last week. And uh, they were favored by seven and a half points over the Denver Broncos, who uh, don't really have a whole lot to uh, hang their hat on this season. You're thinking, wow, if Sean Payton goes anywhere near 500 with this team, that's a pretty good job. Uh, the Broncos defense, very stout, poor weather game. The uh, Jets take the field uh, as seven and a half point favorites. And it's clear from the beginning that something is fucked up. <laughs> and I'm maintaining it's uh, part of a curse that they're operating under, the uh, curse of Joe Willie with the one finger in the air. And as I said, big fan, but uh, I think he doomed the franchise into perpetuity. All right, so uh, the Jets end up uh, losing 10-9 to a team that had its starting quarterback uh, stay in the game the entire game. It wasn't like he got hurt in the first quarter. And he threw for a total of 60 stinking yards. Bo Nix. We are probably uh, inclined to root for Bo Nix, uh, thinking it'd be nice to see a rookie uh, make, make a strong showing, much like uh, D'Angelo is doing for the Commanders. You, you like to see these guys uh, come into the league and, and light it up and make you think there'll be good quarterback play for a long time to come because look at the infusion of talent that's come into the National Football League. We did not see that yesterday with Bo Nix. Uh, completion percentage was okay. Dink passes, 60 yards in total passing. So the Jets are going to lose to a team that had a 60-yard throwing day in an era where like 220 is a common over-under for a team – that, that you think has no quarterback. And we're going to see another example of that tonight. Uh, the Jets uh, lose, uh, end up losing. Zerline misses the uh, field goal try at the end of the game. You see Rodgers with the towel over his head, and there is uh, much concern in, in New York today that the uh, Jets are now El Finito. Uh, people are calling for Robert Salah's head, saying he's a lousy coach. This business uh, of the cadence where Rodgers was – how tremendous was he over the years at drawing teams off sides with that <laughs> – he does that uh, irregular cadence count uh, and uh, the, the voice inflection as well as anybody that we've ever seen in drawing quarterback and uh, opposing defenses offside among quarterbacks in the history of the uh, National Football League. And instead, it works in reverse as uh, his team is flagged for a zillion penalties and uh, they can't get the offense into second gear and uh, end up losing now two and two and having to go to London to play uh, against the Minnesota Vikings. The irony, of course, hovering over a cursed franchise is that uh, who is the early MVP candidate, at least being talked about uh, in uh, these uh, considerations, uh, but Sam Darnold, the guy that uh, they unceremoniously dumped and gave up on, uh, has been bouncing around. Sam Darnold ends up in Minnesota. Of course, uh, Minnesota is inflicted uh, with an injury right away. Donald uh, ends up uh, getting in there as a start starter, and uh, he's done nothing but win. 4-0 uh, off to the uh, best start that Minnesota's had in quite some time, uh, and sure enough, uh, looking like a champ uh, all the way. As the Jets stagger around after uh, dealing all of their assets uh, to acquire Aaron Rodgers and uh, now appear to be in just rough shape. So uh, curse uh, in play there. And um, the action, it was great over the weekend. We had a pretty successful week. It all began on Friday night with the professor hitting uh, with Rutgers, uh, laying one and a half over Washington. It was a struggle. They win by three. And so uh, we uh, get the win in the cover there. And then um, this game came into high question and, and opens up a, a lot of interesting propositions because, uh, well, well, we've seen this. Uh, Ole Miss loses to Kentucky. That was one of the shockers, uh, number six Ole Miss. They were writing their own ticket. Lane Kiffin had played three cupcakes and essentially put up like 60 points on each of them in the first three games that his team played. They run into a Kentucky team uh, that uh, took Georgia right to the wire, and uh, we, we saw that, that that was no small accomplishment with Georgia rowing back in what was a sensational contest uh, against the Alabama Crimson Tide, uh, another game that uh, we happen to be on the right side of. But uh, uh, Ole Miss uh, goes goes against Kentucky, and, and you would have to say that playing these cupcakes early in the season uh, can definitely be a recipe for disaster, for catastrophe. And uh, that was evidenced by the Kentucky win. And, and then we, we maybe saw another example of it with, uh, and you have to consider the Mario Cristobal factor here because uh, the University of Miami on Friday night, uh, one of Troy uh, West's plays, Getting 17 and a half was Virginia Tech in this ballgame. Miami had played a series of weak opposition. In fact, uh, that's the big knock on the Hurricanes so far is that uh, just even playing out the rest of their schedule, the only team with any credibility that they play 
is uh, the Louisville Cardinals. Uh, that's coming up. Uh, they go on the road and play Cal. Uh, we're not sure what to make of them. Life and death to beat an FSU team that looks like it's thrown in the towel uh, on the season. I hate to say that, but uh, wow, Mike Norvell, who is a decent guy and did wonderful things with the Florida State Seminoles, all of a sudden finds himself uh, a deserted man. He's like some bag lady asking for money outside of a shopping center in, uh, or a supermarket. And you're thinking, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I don't have any spare change today, nothing. Uh, and if I did, I'd be happy to give it to you. Uh, just, just begging uh, for something uh, good to happen. And uh, here's, here's the Hurricanes, uh, Mario Cristobal factor. You have to consider it. They go against South Florida. That, that was supposedly the one semi-legitimate opponent they face so far. Uh, this is going back to Friday night now. Where, and the week prior, they, they, they're challenged in the first half by South Florida a team that uh, what was considered to be their toughest opponent to date. They, they had beat up on like the FAMU band and, and a couple of other teams, uh, uh, but even l lesser distinction. And uh, they, they go against Virginia Tech, getting 17 and a half. The uh, Hokies was a great rivalry back in the day. Uh, Virginia Tech, what, when uh, they had Frank Beamer as their head coach, always known for uh, amazing special teams play. And uh, they uh, – Hadn't really, uh, I mean, they were always up and down. Uh, they, they would have one excellent season uh, where they were challenging and uh, beating really highly ranked teams. And and then the next year, they'd kind of drop off because who the fuck would want to go without name, image, and like this money, and, and even with it, to Blacksburg, uh, Virginia? It, it's an ugly place. What What is a hokey? It's like some, some crazed wild mountain turkey. Uh, a place, too, where uh, had that game been at Virginia Tech with the way that it ended up, I, I can assure you that the team bus for the Hurricanes would have been turned over on its side by these fans who were uh, drinking enough moonshine before the game to uh, knock out John Belushi and Animal House. Uh, unbelievable. So anyway, uh, this game on Friday night, and this is the Cristobal factor again, uh, should it have boiled down to uh, a Hail Mary controversial pass, which... Uh, many people are uh, questioning uh, whether the call was uh, corrected in the proper fashion. Uh, did they get it right? Should never uh, have come to that. You would have to think if you were a Hurricanes fan in a 17 and a half point favorite spot. But uh, sure enough, it did. Uh, I have a friend who I, I have uh, great faith in his opinion. Uh, usually uh, has a very solid opinion on things like this. He was working a game for the Westwood One radio crew as uh, one of the spotters there on the team. And so he, he scrutinized this play uh, like it was the Zapruder film and came to the conclusion that the ball was dropped. That, that's going to be debated for a while. If that's happening somewhere else uh, or if it's the usual, uh, the Hurricane fans are always crying that they get uh, shafted. The old Isaac Hayes thing by the ACC referees. I, I, they, they got the benefit of the doubt here, certainly. Uh, they, there was one shot I saw that made it look like the ball had hit the ground, but uh, you, you draw your own conclusions on that one. If you thought the Virginia Tech team got hosed, uh, you, you certainly uh, you know are, are worthy of uh, ha having your opinion respected. But uh, at the same time, if you were getting 17 and a half, you, you were fucking partying the entire ball game. It looked like Virginia Tech was going to win outright until some late heroics there uh, by Cam Ward uh, once again. So so here's Mario Cristobal with with a Heisman Trophy favorite at quarterback and all kinds of. Uh, I mean, talent at the skill positions that, that he's recruited in here and uh, had transfer in. He's got this kid, Restrepo, who you have to watch. He makes a sensational fourth down catch while he's laying on his back. And then you're asking yourself, does this team deserve to be in the top six, seven, eight teams in the country when they're life and death to beat a Virginia Tech team at home in, in uh, what loomed as a very favorable spot? So uh, we end up uh, hitting on that game. And, uh, of course, uh, everybody was zeroed in over the weekend, college football on the Georgia-Alabama game, which uh, we thought Alabama was the play there. Uh, they were uh, getting points at home uh, against a Georgia team that had struggled mightily uh, and pulled out that 13-12 to victory over Kentucky uh, earlier in the season. And uh, sure enough, a rivalry game, uh, that, that's going to ratchet up uh, the uh, intensity factor. And, and Georgia has some big boys. We, we know that. Uh, they, they have uh, had the better of uh, the entire football universe for the last couple of years. A tremendous number of winning streaks going into this game. And yet uh, getting points with Alabama and Jalen Milrow uh, seemed like a very, very favorable spot. And it turned out to be uh, that way, although it's life and death. I mean, if you're psychotic because you're a gambler, uh, you really don't need to question yourself. 
Uh, it, you can't help it. Uh, we, we've said this time and again, if the line makers were running the country, we'd be okay. Uh, look what this boils down to. Uh, late in the game, after uh, being up, uh, what, 30 to 7? After the first half, uh, it's an Alabama blowout looming. Uh, you're thinking, all right, if Georgia can come back and get a score to uh, start the third quarter or early in the third quarter, and uh, they're only two touchdowns down uh, with another two-point conversion. And uh, sure enough, they do it, and, and they get it to 30 to 15. Uh, it took a little longer than uh, you would have liked if you were thinking that Georgia was going to come back. But uh, they come back and take the lead. Uh, the line went off. Uh, we had it at two. The, the line went off, went off, I believe, at one. Uh, Georgia was favored by one point. And, and so they get into a situation where they've come all the way back, roaring back. Uh, Alabama is now on its heels. The momentum is entirely in Georgia's direction. And they take a 31-30 lead. Now, logic dictates they have to go for two points there uh, to go up by a field goal margin. Still time left in the game for Alabama to come back, which they did. And if they make this two-point conversion, you're in a comfortable spot if you're back in Georgia laying one point. If they miss it, all of a sudden, you're compromised to a point where, at best, you're probably going to get a push. And uh, Alabama now has a shot to come back, which they do. They hit a sensational play on its 17-year-old receiver. And uh, they, they score only to have Georgia come back and uh, have to get picked off in the end zone to ultimately lose the game. But you couldn't have asked for much more in terms of drama. We kind of got lucky there with Alabama, even though we had this gigantic lead uh, in the game uh, being on Alabama's side. And for me to be rooting for Alabama, I know it's the post saving era, but uh, that just shows you that there, there is no heart. There's no emotion. You have to be as cold and calculated as Michael Corleone was at the end of Godfather three to uh, possibly, uh, uh, you know, go ahead and, and back Alabama and, and pick the right side in that game. And sure enough, uh, you ended up on the right side of things. So so that was good. That that was uh, going back to uh, Friday night. Uh, here, here's how we fared uh, this week. Uh, we had uh, Troy West, a uh, questionable uh, line there. I don't know where he was getting this line. Was he getting it out of the Jewish Journal or something, some weekly newspaper? Because uh, he had uh, the Cowboys Thursday night, and he was talking about uh, laying four and a half points. Now, the line went off five and a half. And uh, the Cowboys failed to cover by that hook. The hook, once again, a knife right in your back. Uh, the Virginia Tech game was a good call and then uh, hit with the Bengals, only laying four and a half over Carolina. People uh, were all of a sudden infatuated with the idea that Andy Dalton was going to salvage some kind of uh, dignity for uh, the Carolina Panthers, who were god awful with Bryce Young at quarterback uh, first couple of games of the season. They put Dalton in there. He pulls off an outright straight up win, big upset on the board the week prior, but uh, was it going to be enough to beat a desperate Bengals team? And uh, it was not, as the uh, Bengals prevail. So uh, that was good for Troy. Uh, the uh, professor uh, on Friday uh, was 2-2-1, uh, two, two and one, and uh, our, our man Scotty M., who's going to join us tomorrow, uh, ended up 2-1 and one after going down uh, with, uh, with me. I, I, I thought the Buffalo Bills, I, I got duped into thinking the Buffalo Bills were, were just ascending and on a roll. I don't know if anybody else got caught up in this euphoria over their big win over the Jacksonville Jaguars, where they look great. And you saw improvement from week to week with the Buffalo Bills. Their offense seemed to be in complete synchronization. The Baltimore Ravens have struggled, even though they were able to beat the Cowboys. Uh, they had to stave off a late Cowboys comeback. I'm not sure if that was uh, just uh, meaningless uh, scoring in garbage time. But nonetheless, from a substantial 28-6 to lead, they end up uh, holding on to win 28-26 the previous week. So uh, maybe not so great. And they annihilated. I mean, that was uh, an unanticipated blowout uh, last night with uh, the uh, Baltimore Ravens uh, just destroying the Buffalo Bills. So uh, hopefully you guys are on the right side of that one. Uh, we have two games tonight uh, to consider. And uh, this uh, gets back to our theory about uh, always give credence to a team that's possibly playing uh, under a curse. And that would be tonight your Miami Dolphins, uh, our hometown team. They are hosting the Tennessee Titans. And the big question would be, how bad are the Tennessee Titans? Just how bad are they? Will Levis, uh, if you look at some statistical uh, analysis, would rank as the worst quarterback in the league. But uh, you, you can just use the eye test on this. When a quarterback is inclined to uh, go ahead and uh, end up um, executing clown plays, then th that's a bad sign, especially in circumstances where his team somehow miraculously is still somewhat in the competition. 
And we've seen Will Levis do this. Uh, he's been getting chewed out on the sidelines by his coach. Um, as I said, statistically, if you take a whole bunch of cumulative stuff, uh, he, he ranks in, in some of these sabermetric uh, analysis uh, mathematics, uh, he, he ranks as the worst quarterback in the league. And, and, and we're seeing that. Now, all that being said, uh, the curse with the Miami Dolphins, of course, is the curse of Dan Marino. Now, that may be something that we made up or, or something that we have just come to believe. But ever since the Dolphins considered letting Marino go to the Minnesota Vikings at the tail end of his career, yes, he was a shot fighter. Yes, he was less mobile than Joe Cap. He, he wasn't throwing the ball particularly well, and Jimmy Johnson hated him. He wanted to play Damon Heward uh, over Dan Marino and eventually did. Uh, Marino never the same uh, after tearing his Achilles heel. Uh, could there be an equation there with uh, Aaron Rodgers? He didn't look all that great getting sacked five times yesterday. But uh, nonetheless, it, it was so blasphemous, so outrageous, so outright inconsiderate of the Miami Dolphins to ever think about having Marino uh, end his career in another city, sitting on a helmet, a, a, a poor facsimile of his former self, uh, like Joe Namath, the aforementioned Joe Namath, uh, with that uh, ugly picture uh, with him sitting on a Rams helmet, uh, looking like, I don't know if you guys remember this, it goes way back, uh, there was a famous drawing by an artist named Robert Rieger, who uh, used to do these uh, great renderings of sports figures. And he had a picture of uh, Y.A. Tittle with the blood dripping down. I mean, uh, it, in defeat after losing a NFL championship game to the Chicago Bears. That's way back in the day. I think he was wearing a leather helmet. But uh, that being said, I mean, you hate to see this. You hate to see Johnny Unitas uh, coming out there with, with a lightning bolt on his helmet. Uh, and you didn't want to see, if you were a Dolphin fan or a fan of Dan Marino, which I was, uh, you, you didn't want to see this guy end up with another team. Since that time, what have they done? Nothing. Fucking nothing. So could you assume, is it an insinuation to think that maybe the Miami Dolphins are operating under a curse? Look, their best laid plans already are, are shot to shreds just uh, absolutely imploded on them as uh, they have Tua Tagovailoa's career in doubt and uh, not playing. He he's vowed to come back. Well, we don't know when. They play this guy, Skylar Thompson, that they had on the roster for uh, the last three years. He looks like absolute garbage to the point where it was almost uh, one of those things where they're th thinking, oh, well, you know, when he got hurt, we don't have to worry about starting him. Because if they had a decision to make between Skylar Thompson with what we saw last week in Seattle – and uh, Tyron Huntley, who they signed off the Baltimore Ravens practice squad, uh, the, the town now is thinking and uh, the general consensus uh, around South Florida, where the Dolphins, of course, hail from, is that, oh, they're going to be much better off with Tyron Huntley. Uh, Huntley has barely played. This guy's played like 20 NFL games. There was a time there where he, he was uh, somewhat uh, of a representation of what the skill set was of Lamar Jackson, not in the same category. Don't mean to apply that, but... Uh, he could run, he could throw on the run, and he acquitted himself pretty well as a substitute for Jackson uh, briefly with the Baltimore Ravens, and people thought, well, this guy could be a viable starter. But he wasn't. And uh, so he, he's been limited to 20 games. I, I don't know if he's any savior, and if he is, is he good enough to help the Dolphins uh, overcome the curse of Marino, as we've implied? Uh, they are laying two and a half now to the Tennessee Titans. So the Titans will uh, answer the question tonight uh, if they're as bad as we think they are. And, and yet, uh, I, I have very little faith. I'm going to stay out of this game. Very little faith in the Miami Dolphins. Uh, should they win this game at home with uh, what they represent offensively? You would think yes. And yet, if you look at things, they're averaging like 14 stinking points a game. Uh, even with Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddell, and uh, HN and the entire cast of Dolphin Speedsters. It's not happening, and Mike McDaniel is starting to look like Professor Irwin Corey. He's starting to look a little goofy uh, as a play caller, especially, uh, and an NFL head coach. So uh, that, that one I'm going to stay out of. Uh, Detroit and, and the Seahawks, uh, an interesting matchup. Detroit has certainly underachieved and not looked nearly as sharp as we thought they were going to be starting the season with Dan Campbell inspiring them by eating a wild boar before the game. Maybe he'll do that tonight in the Motor City. The Seahawks uh, were just, just hovering there for the longest time last week uh, and beating the Miami Dolphins. They did cover the point spread, but um, don't, don't look like a, any kind of offensive juggernaut. Uh, they're getting three and a half points, though, against the Detroit Lions. And so, uh, again, one of those uh, situations where you, you could make a case for taking the points with the Seahawks, 
but but I'm thinking maybe like the Ravens did yesterday, the Lions get it together. I I, I would also be inclined to take a pass through on, on this game, but um, you would have to think that that the Lions uh, need to do something to establish themselves uh, themselves in this game, much like uh, we saw with uh, Travis Kelsey, who was getting ripped all over social media for being a shot fighter. And uh, he, he comes back and has like 11 catches in this game with the Chiefs, who, who look pretty vulnerable also. So um, a lot of interesting things uh, happen in the NFL. The two games tonight look very dangerous. Dolphins uh, laying uh, two and a half against the Titans at home. Uh, your, your immediate knee-jerk reaction would think Titans are awful, so the Dolphins cover. I, I would uh, trend lightly on that thing. And the Seahawks getting three and a half against Detroit. Uh, Detroit yet to establish that uh, they are a Super Bowl contender as uh, we thought them to be after they almost made it there last year, except for the uh, brain-dead decision-making of Dan Campbell under pressure to go ahead and, me macho man, stick with what I've done all season. And uh, going for these uh, fourth down plays uh, with passing plays, which uh, turned out to be loomed as a large mistake. Uh, Braves and the Mets, uh, somebody sweeps uh, and the Diamondbacks get in. Otherwise, the two teams split. It's going to be the uh, Braves and the Mets uh, making the postseason. So uh, interesting little sidebar uh, to uh, today. Uh, Shohei Otani comes within an eyelash. Uh, if he got two more hits in yesterday's season finale, regular season finale for the Dodgers, he wins the Triple Crown as uh, Louis Arise went in and throws a very uncharacteristic, long, season-ending slump. I think he went 5 for 28, so his batting average dropped. But congratulations to him, an excellent Rod Carew-type hitter and an entertaining player to watch because uh, he makes contact. He puts the ball in play, and he's now led uh, the American League and then subsequently the National League uh, in uh, batting average. He's won the batting title, American League, and then two years in a row with two different teams in the National League. Uh, Louis Rice, congratulations there. But Shohei Itani nearly pulled off a triple crown uh, for the uh, Dodgers. And, and, and how is Caitlin Clark not the MVP of the uh, WNBA? I know the fever got knocked out. And uh, two games uh, in their playoff series, uh, she got them to the playoffs, but a 48% increase in, in the amount of money that uh, the league took in. They are featured on uh, 60 Minutes as an up-and-coming thing. Th this was a league that was on the uh, precipice uh, and the uh, threshold uh, of extinction. And all of a sudden, uh, they're talking about expansion, and they are going to add uh, more teams in. And Caitlin Clark made them all this money. Uh, if ever there was a definition of most valuable player, the value of this woman to that league has been incredible. Right. Uh, we're going to get out of here uh, tomorrow. We'll have uh, Scotty M. We'll get into our handicapping uh, football and uh, maybe take a look at baseball as well as uh, we'll have uh, some, some steam on that later in the week. Troy West, uh, who's uh, eight and one on the show so far in the weeks we've been doing this. Uh, very, very uh, nice run here. Uh, he'll join us on Wednesday. Uh, we're going to try and uh, bring in uh, Mike Jones on baseball on Thursday and a professor on college football on Friday. So that's the lineup for this week. See you next time. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Beware of teams operating under a curse. Uh, for the people that know Filter.net and Bet Online, I'm Jeff DeForest. Uh, we'll see you next time on the next edition of Barrier Bookie.